Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at All Three Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Antonio Enrico from Milan, Italy. Professor Enrico is currently chairman of the Pediatric Orthopedic Department at Children's Hospital at UC Milan. After completing his residency program in orthopedic surgery at Milan, he pursued further training at the DuPont Institute for Children in Wilmington in 1997. He attended several prestigious pediatric orthopedic departments during his professional life, including the Children's Hospital in Chicago, Hospital Lee Infants in Geneva, Hospital Lee Peroni in Montpelier, the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas. He worked as pediatric orthopedic department consultant at the Arago Children's Hospital in Alexandria, and then at the Regina Margarita Children's Hospital pediatric orthopedic department in Turin from 2003 till 2019 and as chairman since 2007. He's an active member of the European Pediatric Orthopedic Society, where he has held several positions over the years, and currently he is slated to take over as the president of the European Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Professor Andrew Q also serves as specialty editor for traumatology for Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics, Part B, and he's also the member of the editorial board of Children's Orthopedics Journal, and also the editorial member for Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics B. He's also the reviewer for several high impact publications in pediatric orthopedics and has several, written several book chapters in pediatric orthopedics. He's also the author for three books. His main field of interest are pediatric trauma, tough foot, infection, cerebral palsy, and benign bone tumors. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor Antonio Andricchio from Milan, Italy. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for your kindly invitation. I'm very happy to be here. To, good evening to everybody. And so our speech is about the uh, complex fracture like uh, such as the distal tibia and transitional fractures. So this kind of fracture are among the five most common fractures types in uh, children and has reported in land in, J in JPO in 1997. So uh, uh, let me check how to proceed. I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, so the distal tibia and grow plate is very important to, to recall the, the, the most part of the tibia is uh, the growing in the proximal part of the, of the tibia. And uh, the, uh, for the risk of epiphysial disease in the distal part of the tibia is pretty high. And it's pretty high as well, the axial deviation and uh, with the ankle virus or vulgar deviation and recurvatum or precurvatum. So in adults, we can, uh, we can use uh, and uh, adopt this kind of uh, uh, classification is the Lauge Hansen classification. And uh, he uh, recognized uh, as uh, the mechanism of injury in order to try to divide this kind of fracture. Uh, later on the following this kind of uh, uh, classification, Diaz and Taxigen uh, reported that the almost the same uh, classification for the children so even in this case we you can uh, recognize supination inversion fracture pronation aversion external rotation supination external rotation and supination plantar flexion is four different mechanism of injury which can uh, can carry some different part of, of fracture like uh, this one is a supination and inversion and uh, uh, the other one is a pronation aversion and external rotation and supination and the external rotation and supination and plantar flexion. So for the solterary classification is a little bit tricky to define this kind of fracture according this kind of a classification. It's pretty easy for the most of the uh, fracture in childhood, but this particular part of the distal tibia could be difficult to, to uh, identify the correct uh, way. 
the reason, uh, the, the, the heart of the matter is the asymmetric physical closure of this part of the tibia. So you can recognize the comes bump. Here's a, a like undulation of the distal part of the physis of the tibia. And the, uh, the ossification is a pretty asymmetric because it started just right in the middle. Then the, the, the ossification progressed medially and then uh, ended uh, from the uh, lateral part of this part. That's the reason why we have a transitional fracture because it is a skeletal mature two versus the skeletal mature. So the distal tibial growth plate has no the same time closure. And that's the reason why we have uh, this process. And uh, on average, this, this take uh, the time takes uh, one year and a half in order to complete the ossification. So this, this kind of fracture occur through growth plate not yet fused. On the lateral side, and that's the reason why it's a pretty difficult and sometimes is really uh, difficult to recognize it. Is uh, almost uh, around the 10% ankle fracture in children involving the joint, and is a typical fracture in boys between 13 and 15 years old and girls 12 and 14 years old. Uh, that's the reason, uh, just because I, I, I already told, is a, a typical of the closure of the distal part of the tibia. So we never find this kind of fracture before 10 years of age and um, over 16 years of age. So the triplane ankle fracture are complex fracture, which involves the epiphysis, physis, and posterior metaphysis of the distal part of the tibia, represent 5% to 10% of the pediatric intraarticular ankle injuries. So this fracture line, the axial plane may be challenging to identify intraoperatively, especially in percutaneous fixation with limited exposure. So knowledge of the common fracture plane can be useful to determine optimal screws trajectory to compress the bone fragment effectively. So is a recent paper from GBJS from Adad. He tried to examine a lot of a fracture, different uh, triplanar fracture in order to better identify which is the most common uh, fragments and in order to identify which is the best position to fix this fracture um, by screws, like in this part. So rarity, complexity, variability of this fracture have been understanding and treating this fracture difficult. CT scan is useful to accurate identification and classification of triplane fracture. Van Larhoven uh, yeah, on paper on injury in 1992, tried to identify and define this uh, different pattern of fracture. You can find this pretty difficult to recall all these kinds. So uh, Raparis in JPO in 1996, uh, almost tried to uh, modify the previous uh, classification, identify a lot of different uh, types of the triplane fracture. And even in this case, it's pretty uh, tricky to, to try to recall all this part, all this kind of different part of fracture. From the practical point of view, when you can see, uh, like in this case, uh, a fibular fracture, you have to recall in 50% of the cases we have associated with a triplane fracture. So it's, a, it's a, like an alarm. Uh, you can uh, open your mind when you can see uh, a fracture of the distal part of the fibula. So the triplane fracture, uh, uh, always from the practical point of view, is a complex fracture. And it seems, uh, resembles, uh, Salter varies type three or four on AP view, and such as a Salter varies type two on lateral view. So that's the reason why uh, many times the residents are uh, pretty uh, astonished. Uh, anyway, they, they really don't understand because on one plan you can identify like uh, uh, type three or four, but on the lateral view is another in another pattern. So they 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 pretty don't understand. That's uh, the 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 real proof there is a, a three plane fraction. So the goal of our treatment is first obtain and then to maintain a satisfying reduction. And so we, are, we, we confront with several problems. And uh, the problem is first, 
failure to recognize the fracture. So like in this case, you can find it's pretty difficult to, to identify correctly the fracture on the X-ray plane. And with the uh, CT scan, you can pretty easily identify this kind of fracture. The second problems uh, during the treatment is uh, to uh, provide uh, or to, to find an adequate, an adequate uh, reduction. So we have a, a closed reduction under general anesthesia or not. And you can see here with a, uh, with a cast, um, it seems a good reduction, but on the lateral view is not so good and satisfying, but we, you can, when you take a, a CT scan, you can find there is a gap over four millimeters. And so probably is uh, surely is not acceptable in order to have a good reduction of this fracture with a conservative uh, treatment. The third problem is uh, and the follow-up, so the lay joint disease. If uh, even when you find uh, and obtain a good reduction with, uh, with the screw or whatever you want, uh, sometimes because there is injury of the grow plate, you can find in the, the progress of the uh, Progressing the time, there is a virus deviation anyway, is a fishtail deformity or whatever. And so we have uh, uh, to uh, apply a strict follow-up for these uh, uh, patients. So the, the first question is when you we can friend, we have to treat this kind of fracture. Uh, we, we, can, uh, we can consider X-ray enough in order to have a good diagnosis and, uh, and consequently to approach in the proper way this, this fracture. So uh, first, uh, AP and lateral view is not enough. So we have to have uh, uh, an oblique view in order to better assess the fracture, like in these two pictures. But it's very important to have a CT scan. Uh, uh, today, diagnosis, displacement entity, pre-op planning, we are not to have this, uh, all these issues without to have a good uh, imaging. And so the CT scan is uh, almost uh, mandatory at this time. So this is a paper in JPO in 2011 who um, reported their experience. And uh, the conclusion was that around 50% of fracture classification based on plane radiograph after CT scan examination show a different pattern. So the use of CT scan changed the proposed treatment from non-operative to operative in 20% of cases and changed the preoperative plan for screw placement in 41% of cases. So the findings from this study support the CT scan as a useful adjunctive radiograph when classifying and treating pediatric tree plane fractures. So after reviewing CT scan, 39% of the fracture classified as zero or less two millimeter displaced by radiograph were changed to more plus than two millimeter displacement. So which have a, uh, warranted a change in treatment of the basis of the current guidelines recommending surgical treatment for T plane fractures displaced more than two millimeters. And uh, consequently, you have to uh, approach in a different way. Uh, another practical point of view from the uh, practical point of view, when you examine the, the coronal and axial CT scan, is uh, this find, uh, these findings, is there three pointed stars like a Mercedes Benz car uh, is a symbol. And so when you, when you can find these uh, uh, images, on your CT scan, probably uh, pretty sure you, you have to front a three plane fracture. So, so this, is a, this is an example, is a boy, uh, 14 years old with this, this kind of X-ray, uh, the plane X-ray. And you can find in AP and lateral view, there is a fracture, but is not, uh, it not seems too displaced. 
but when you uh, go to the um, CT scan, you can find absolutely different uh, uh, pattern uh, if you compare with the plain radiograph. So of course you can have to change completely your mind and you don't approach this kind of fracture without the CT scan and uh, consequently you have to approach with a, a surgical way and not with the conservative. So the conservative treatment has a paramount importance to act on relaxed patient under general anesthesia in order to better manipulate and try to really reduce this fracture. And so repeated reduction maneuvers entail an increased risk of epiphysiodesis. Uh, usually the literature says no more than three attempts of reduction. After that, you have to shift into the open reduction. Here on the on your uh, bottom left, you can find intraoperative images. And you can find uh, with the pickup there is a, the periosteum is really thick, and when in in, in, in traflexed into the fracture is difficult to. Uh, reduce the fracture from one side and the other side is open the window, open the door to the, to the complication during the follow-up. That's the reason why uh, you have to, to keep in your mind, you have to try to, to, to reduce the fracture, but not to, to, to think uh, continually to manipulate this fracture because if the fracture uh, under general anesthesia doesn't uh, reduce adequately, probably there is a, something wrong is not, it is not possible to reduce in the uh, adequate way. So three millimeters uh, was reported by Barmada uh, has a, a gap uh, with a less of two years remaining growth as a high risk of epiphysiodesis. So uh, a little bit later in 1984, Klinger reported that, uh, which any fracture with two millimeters gap or more has to surgically reduce in order to avoid joint incongruity and minimize the risk of early arthritic degeneration. And now there is a, a GBJS paper of uh, the last year, and uh, he reported that like uh, uh, upper limit uh, is a two millimeter and elf. So uh, in, in order to try to minimize the possibility to have a, a sequelae for this kind of uh, fracture. So open reduction and internal fixation or closed reduction, internal fixation by screws parallel to the physis is the gold standard to treat this kind of, of uh, fracture. And if you have uh, availability to use the bioreserbable screws, have the advantage do not uh, uh, remove it. So uh, intraoperative arthrography could be uh, a good option to check uh, intraoperatively if you have really reduced the gap of the fracture. So you can find here this kind of uh, fracture of the medial malleolus is, is the type three um, uh, fracture of the salteraris. And after your surgery, you can check if the, the, the gap is completely closed by a very easy uh, technical with the arthrography. If you need to open reduction approach, you can use the anteromedial or anterolateral approach in order to better have a good view on your fracture, then reduce the fracture. And this is very important after you have reduced the fracture and maintained the reduction to try to have a, a good uh, uh, compression with the, usually with the screws. So uh, the last part of my uh, talk is about a, a typical uh, and particular fracture, three plane fracture is uh, uh, under the eponymous of the T-low fracture, is a juvenile to low fracture is a type three or more seldom time for uh, solitary distal tibial fissile fracture. So the traumatic mechanism is due to a supination and external rotation sprain of the ankle with a bone fragment evolution. So here there is the tibial fibular ligament insertion and close to the closure of the distal tibial physis. So it is a, usually is a like a sprain of the, of the ankle, but because of this, uh, this age, there is uh, the particular anatomic pattern uh, 
of the transitional closure, there is a, this kind of fracture. So uh, the anatomical reduction is mandatory because it is a joint uh, uh, fracture. And so we have to restore the surface of the joint in order to avoid the, the, the sequelae uh, and uh, avoid to the arthritis in the future of this uh, girl or boy. So uh, the upsetums is no more than two millimeter and two millimeters and half. And uh, uh, usually you can try to reduce with a closed reduction internal fixation. And sometimes you have to uh, open this uh, uh, fracture in order to have a better view and to have a complete restoring of the surface of the joint with a good uh, um, surgery. So the Tillow fracture is in a complex entity. The CT scan, even in this case, is mandatory to obtain some time the best reduction as much as possible. And the upper limit is two or two millimeters and a half. And close the reduction, the open reduction with internal fixation by candelated skew without the physis violation is, uh, uh, is very important. For the low surgical approach, you can use the, uh, the anterior approach in order to, to better uh, have a good vision of your fracture just in front of, uh, uh, of you. Uh, when you open uh, uh, directly on the fracture, you can easily to approach this kind of fracture. So uh, regarding the hardware removal, the parents have to know that screws in the distal tibia should be removed on average one year post-operatively. Hardware removal surgery later than one year can lot sometimes some complication like breakage or whatever. And so if you decided to remove this, this hardware, it's better to uh, respect this uh, upper limit. The most frequent complication is epiphysidesis, is it partial or complete and can be linked to the fracture time. So uh, these uh, authors reported that the, 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 the most milder um, mildest uh, fractures like type one and type two have a, a, a milder consequence uh, between two and 39% and the, the more severe uh, physical fracture type three and four had uh, even uh, till 50% of complication. Epiphysiodesis process can take even two years to become evident. So it's very important to establish a strictly follow-up program because you are not uh, uh, be sure that after six months or whatever, you have uh, uh, out of the possibility to, uh, to develop some troubles and, uh, and complications. So at the end of my speech, I, I can take it as a take home message. Number one is a tray plane fracture have an high risk to be underestimated. So CT scan to avoid to fail to recognize the fracture as a part of tray plane fracture. So it's very important. This is a, an intraoperative CT scan just only to be sure you have a, a, a good fixation and good or a good reduction before to approach in the uh, surgical view. But anyway, it's very important to recognize and study this kind of fracture. The second message is reduction has to be as much as anatomic is possible because three plane and T low fracture have an acceptable limit, uh, two millimeters gap and a gap over two 0.5 millimeter in a patient with estimated residual growth two years or more has to be operated. There is no way. And in the end, uh, it's very important to uh, a strictly follow up program because uh, you have to establish in order to assess and check the physis after the fracture healing in order to early correct the axial or growth deviation. And thank you very much for your invitation and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Fantastic lecture. A lot of information. Thank you. Just a few questions. Uh, how common do you get uh, physial bars, that is epiphysial disease, and do they have any particular pattern? For example, do they go into varus or do they go into valgus? How do they so present? So the, 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 the first uh, issue is to, to think there is a, this 
this problem can develop. So the first uh, um, issue or my first advice is to check the patient. After that, if you are not pretty sure, you have uh, to take an MRI. With an MRI after six months or nine months, you can uh, you can start to uh, to see uh, the 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 physical bar. Uh, another uh, X-ray check is uh, if you you take a new check, you can you can appreciate on the plain X-ray the Harris uh, lines, the Harris Park lines. If they are linear, probably there is everything is going well and smoothly. But if you have some interruption or not completely homogeneous uh, uh, these lines of the uh, on the plan x-ray probably there is a something wrong after that uh, you have to consider uh, um, it's a different uh, epiphysio disease if you compare with the distal physial fracture of the distal femur or whatever because this is a transitional fracture so are their the fracture are very close to the uh, hand of the of the growth so um, difference with the other uh, epiphysiodesia or physical bar can you have to approach in, in order to treat and try to to uh, to avoid this de defect uh, usually the most of the cases are very close to the end of the of the growth so you can uh, wait till uh, the completely ending of this crow and then to approach the correction uh, and you are pretty sure then when you correct this kind of uh, deformity you have no no other recurrence or relapse or, or whatever so you can wait you can check and then usually if something wrong is 14 15 years old so you can approach with a distal osteotomy in order to correct the the, the, the virus and to have a, in one shot you completely restore the alignment and uh, and the tape and do you need to resect the physial bar is there a role for resection there is no really a role for resection because uh, uh, otherwise there is very very young uh, girls or boy i mean uh, probably 11 years old 12 years old but it's pretty rare to to observe this kind of fracture in this uh, in this age because usually it's more than 12 between 12 and 14 15 years old and that's the reason why you don't usually approach the resection of the physical bar so you can uh, just to observe just to study and then when the, when the 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 grow has, has ended and the distal part of the tibia you can you can approach safely and you try to correct in in just with one surgery the 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 axial deviation in, in just the, in order to avoid this other other surgery or, or whatever recurrence or whatever you know thank you professor for that just one more question before we wind up the session what is the long term uh, result for example do patients do have long term ankle pain and degeneration if there's a persistent step off sorry say again because i i, the, I didn't hear uh, do patients repeat. have long term ankle pain and ankle degeneration. Sorry, I'm sorry. The voice. <laughs> yeah, the voice is uh, coming out, and so I, I, I can appreciate it. I didn't understand the, 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 the question. The incidence of long-term ankle pain and degeneration, ankle degeneration. Okay, but there is, you know, there is no completely. In the literature, there is no completely uh, consensus about that because there, every uh, paper has not so many patients and there is no a real uh, good follow-up and there is uh, something absolutely um, a, a great discrepancy between 2% till 50%, but there is a, a large bias. So there are in, inside, there are people who are treated by conservatively uh, metered. The other one is not properly uh, treated. The other one, there was uh, a delay in treatment. So it's pretty difficult to really uh, have a, a good conclusion. The, the best conclusion is try to assess the fracture because sometimes even in our 
country, there is no recognizing the, the fracture because the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the adult fracture, the adult uh, surgeon are not used to treat this kind of fracture. So they don't suspect this kind of fracture. So they, they, uh, they, they see the x-ray and say, okay, it's a pretty good uh, uh, reduction. So we can uh, use a conservative treatment and, and, and that's it. And then we have uh, some displacement or whatever. Sometimes they don't recognize any time the, the, the fracture. So the, the people start walking uh, on their fracture. They're very painful and whatever and say, and, and after that, they refer the patient after two or three weeks after the fracture. So it, it's really... And the landscape is, is pretty variegated because there is no a, a real uh, good way to, to study this patient. So the, the, the main risk is to, uh, to recognize the fracture first and then to study the, the fracture in the proper way. And usually the, ex, the, the CT scan is very important and after that to, to treat it. And when you approach with the, with the conservative treatment, try to reduce, of course, the first attempt is to reduce the, the fracture is to try to have a good relaxation. So it's better to have a general anesthesia be very short time and then to assess in the, in the, after the, the, the cast if you have really uh, have the, a, a good reduction. Uh, otherwise, you have to shift it to the surgery. I, I think this is one of the fractures that require more awareness among other yeah. big surgeons. Exactly. exactly. Okay, thank you, Professor. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Fantastic lecture, and this is going to Thank be viewed you. by a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.